Let's get into mistake number two, assuming that because you taught something, students have learned it. Now, I have a story for you, which I'm a little bit embarrassed about, but I know I'm among friends here. So I was teaching a class last year. So even though I was assistant principal in this big school, I still had a teaching load. And I'd been working with this foundation class and we'd done all this stuff for Jack and the Beanstalk and we'd recited it and, and done a whole bunch of work with it. And I asked a question about Jack and the Beanstalk and this little fella put his hand up and I don't normally do hands up, but he didn't participate very often. So I thought, oh, I'm just gonna take it. So he put his hand up and I said, yes, mate. And he looked at me straight in the eye and said, I like donuts. And I was like, oh, wonderful. Um, okay. And that was marvelous feedback for me. Um, but it was a bit funny because he sounded just like Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons. Um, but anyway, uh, that was feedback to me that I had not done enough to engage him. I had made an awful lot of assumptions about his engagement. Let's have a look at how I could have done it better and some tips to help you as well. The reality is that students need to engage with material practice with it and apply it. So if you are writing stuff down, there's three words from that I really want you to write down. Engage, practice, apply. Engage, practice, apply. Count them off on your fingers because we're going to talk about them quite a lot. I love, love, love this graphic. And if you are one of those NT people, I really hope that you recognize this because it's from the Northern Territory Department of Education. The gradual release of responsibility model, I do, we do, you do, is not new to us. It's been around for a long time. But the NT, some very clever people in the NT department, kind of put that model on steroids and I love it. And there's two things that really stand out for me. The first one is this building the field here. We assume that children come to us with the background knowledge and background experiences to know what we're talking about. Or we assume that they're ready, they're already tuned in and they're ready to go. So building the field and actually spending a significant amount of time building the field, including pre-teaching vocabulary and concepts, just makes the biggest difference ever. The other thing that I wanna share with you is supported practice. Now, any time, the wheels have fallen off in my teaching. It's been because I did not provide enough supported practice. And I think back to before I really knew about explicit teaching and really understood it, and I would model and deconstruct like a champion. I did what I thought was joint construction and I now know was not nearly active enough for the students. And we get into that in the masterclass. Uh, we're in the masterclass, in the teach along, sorry. But supported practice, I just skipped that completely. So I did this half hearted kind of we do business. And then I said, okay, your turn. Now I had been sending these kids off to do what I thought they could do and they had no clue. So the spectacular falling off of the wheels every single time came back to supported practice. We're going to talk about this explicit teaching model a little bit more in a moment. Back to this. No, it's not a mistake. It's there on purpose because I need to remind you about those three words. Engage, practice, apply. This um, poster is absolutely free to download from DataWorks. You can see it on the bottom of the screen, just Google DataWorks. Um, I do DataWorks teaching because there is another company of the same name and they get a little mixed up. But it is from uh, John Hollingsworth and crew. And this book is going to blow your mind if you haven't seen it. Explicit direct instruction. Now I have the English learners version because of where I was teaching, 80% of our kids had English as an additional language or dialect. However, when I talk with teachers, and it was particularly when I was preparing for the upcoming teach along, I spoke with a number of teachers and said, what are your biggest challenges? And they said, children are just simply not coming to school with the prerequisite oral language skills they need. And we're talking children from English speaking families as well. So I don't think you can go wrong with the English learners version because it's a big focus on language development. But essentially 
What this is about, contrary to the straw man arguments that explicit teaching is not about students, it is about creating maximum engagement for students in the lesson. So they're not sitting there picking the carpet or staring out the window or thinking about what game they played with at play at lunchtime. They're actually engaged in what you're teaching. And here's the structure. Here's one of them. This is called tapple, as you can see. So you teach something, then you ask a question, but we're not going to go into the whole, put your hand up. Who knows? Who knows? And this is so ingrained in us, in our teaching habits, that it can be a hard habit to break. You're going to ask a question and then get your students to pair share. So you can say, talk to your partner. And if you are sitting on the other side of this screen saying, Jocelyn, you have not met the students in my class, I'm going to tell you I probably have, but it's unlike them. Um, I've taught in some of Australia's most remote schools with our most disadvantaged kids, and you can teach it. But we can't assume that they have these learning behaviours. Every learning behaviour you want to see in your classroom, you have to teach it and develop it over time. So you get them to pair, share and talk with each other. Now, if you've got them in that seating grid that I showed you before, you're paying very close attention. You're particularly paying attention to your yellow kitties at the front. So you're actually listening to them. Ideally, you can intervene and adjust their misconceptions straight away. But if not, there's a chance to do that. And I'll show you how to do it in this um, structure. So you've paid attention to what they've said. Now, the way that you choose which children will um, give you the answer could be with a tin with some paddle pop sticks in it with their name and you can do it randomly. The other way you can do it is be quite strategic. So if someone gave an answer to their partner that you went, oh, I need everyone to hear that. So I'm going to use my student response as a model for everyone else. You ask them. You might also not be sure how well someone engaged. You know, there's 25 kids in front of you. You can't keep up with everything all the time. So you might ask that student. Now, if they give you an answer that is a misconception, you don't just leave it there and have them hanging. You say to them, I like the thinking I just saw you doing. What I want you to do now is listen, okay? And then you ask some other students. If the other students also have misconceptions, that's an opportunity for you to reteach in the moment. And this goes across your whole curriculum. This isn't just about reading or literacy. If they've given you answers that are on the money, then you go back to the student. You don't just leave them there and you say, what did they say? What did they say? And they tell you and you go, fantastic listening. Well done to you. So if you create a classroom culture where mistakes are welcomed and expected, this is not a traumatic experience for children. They're not embarrassed. They go, oh, okay, I need to listen now. But that's about creating classroom culture. That provision of effective feedback in the moment that targets specifically what the students have done is really, really impactful and can have a big impact, I've said that twice, but can have a big impact on the information your students walk away from the lesson with, because we know that once they get a, a concept in their minds, it can be really tricky to adjust it if they're certain that they were right. And here it is again, again, not a mistake, engage, practice, apply. If you haven't written it down yet, go ahead, do it now. There are three things in this bit about practice. So we've seen the forgetting curve graphic. We need to intentionally schedule practice in, and it doesn't have to be a whole separate thing. You can include it in the lesson, but the practice needs to be spaced out appropriately. It is much better to do very short snippets and short chunks often than to do one big revision session a week. And Practice is more powerful when you are asking children to retrieve something from their memory. The research is really interesting around if you are trying to prepare for a test, for example, if you're an older student and you just read notes, the 
impact of you your practice is less than if you test yourself so even just the act of trying to remember something is more powerful we need to include revision of previously learned materials every day provide more practice than you think your students will ever need we need it to that point where they can never forget it and we need to give children time and in our overcrowded curriculum and our overcrowded timetables that can be really, it can feel hard, but choose your kids and give them enough practice time so that they can reach mastery. Because if we move on before they have the knowledge and skills embedded in their long-term memory, we're giving them a whole bunch of surface learning that doesn't support them. They have wobbly whole field foundations to their learning. All right, I'm going to show you how to easily differentiate your daily review in phonics and reading. But before I do, I just want to show you this graphic again, this photo, because this is critical to what I'm about to share with you. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then I'm going to have a new share. Oops, is that the one I want to do? This one? I talk to myself often, sorry about that. Okay, so here is our daily phonics review. Now, I am a huge fan of resources that you create one time and instructional routines that you teach to students one time and then you just flip out the content. Who has time to be making everything from scratch? I know you don't and you want to get to the beach when you can not feel guilty that you spent the weekend with your family and friends. So create things that are, I call them sustainable routines that they go over time. Kids don't get bored. Anyone played wordscapes? I play wordscapes. I'm so excited. I'm on some mountain level now. It means nothing, but you can adjust small things to keep the interest there. So you can, this pattern, this week we've got a little monster in the corner of our PowerPoint and they love it. They think it's awesome. Okay. So here's what it is. I've actually decided that I'm going to email you all this PowerPoint. So I'm not going to read all this. You can read it when you get it. But I want to give you this resource so that you've got something that you can just use straight away and adjust it to suit your needs. The first skill we're practicing is we are learning to recognize graphemes. And so we're going to show children graphemes or letters that they have learned before. We've taught these things and now we're providing, think back to that explicit teaching model, now we're providing supported practice. So they need to know them a bit before we include them here. And so what I've done is color code. So yellow group, I want you to tell me what this sound is. Now your whole class might be participating here, but your eyes are on the yellow group because you've sat them together. You don't have to be looking in four different directions at once because what you're looking for is how confident they are in saying the sound. And so you run it through and we've, I've just put three in and then I've mixed up the order. So they do it again. And this is super snappy. This, as I'm showing it to you, will be a little slow because I'm explaining as we go. But once you teach the students the routine, it's really fast. And now you can see it's the pink group's turn. So the blue group and the pink group are now participating. You've got two groups joining in. For the yellow group, this is what I call exposure without expectation. They're not up to this yet. They are still working on those sounds that I just showed you, but they're seeing that these other things exist and they're getting a little bit of exposure, but I'm not expecting them to join in because my yellow guys, it's more than likely that they reach cognitive overload very quickly. So this is some of my challenge when people go, oh, you can just teach it whole group. And then we're, you know, we're bringing those, that bottom group up, maybe not, but this does give them the exposure to that there are other things without stressing them. For the blue group, this is revision. And so we go through, we keep working, and it's the same deal, the same three things. Oh, maybe not, well, oh, doesn't matter. Um, and now we're up to the blue group, and we now have exposure without expectation for both the yellow and the pink group. Now, this, as I said, is fast. So the kids aren't sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes with nothing to do. We are learning to write 
graphemes. Here's where the retrieval comes in. So you have your children ha have a mini whiteboard. Now, if you don't have a whole class set of whiteboards, get yourself a good quality set of plastic sleeves, put a piece of paper in there or a piece of cardboard and sticky tape it at the top. But you need the really good thick ones because the thin ones, they just don't work. And so you need to train the children to use the whiteboards. I've lost my text, oh, here it is. You need to train them to use the whiteboards. So after they finish writing, they're not going to sit and be putting rainbows and fairies in the corner of their board. You're going to train them that when they're finished, the lid goes on the texter, the texter goes next to them, and their arms are folded like this. Yep, it's a little bit Sergeant Major-ish, but a class without rules and routines is chaos. So you teach them to do that, and I'll get to why that's important in a sec. So you will know ahead of time that you want your yellow group to practice a, ah, your pink group to practice t, and your blue group to practice sh. You know that ahead of time. So you're not going to show it to them first up because we want them to retrieve it as we saw. So you say, yellow group, your sound is ah. Write ah. Pink group, your sound is t. Blue group, your sound is sh. Write that down. And you are watching them. Now, you may not get to see what everyone does because you just can't see them amongst the group of children. But what you can do in one of the techniques they teach in explicit direct instruction is to teach children to chin it. So after they finish writing, you can say chin it and every child puts their board, every child puts their board up underneath their chin like that and then you can see the whole class. Now the kids can't see their board and they can't see next door's board or behind or in front. So there's no um, shame job if they make a mistake. But you can see them all. Okay, moving on. So then you show it to them. And when you show it, you say ticket or fix it. Write that one down in your workbook. Ticket or fix it. There is no crossing. There are no mistakes. We're ticking or we're fixing. And then I say to them, fixing is learning. And so I say, fixing is, and the children say learning. So we're building that culture that mistakes are expected, encouraged, and okay. And then we do another one. Now you'll build up. When you first start teaching them the routine, it takes them a little while. So you might just do one to start. And the next week you might have two and the next week you might have three. And that's okay. You just adjust that to the pace of your kids. So the next skill we're working on is we are learning to blend words. So we are going to differentiate not just the content, but we are going to differentiate the support structures that we are providing. So let me show you what that looks like. For our yellow group, I'm going to give them the word grapheme by grapheme because they're not necessarily blending effectively yet this little group. So I'm giving them the, graph the, the word grapheme by grapheme and as well, you may have everyone else joining in. Or if you just want to hear the yellow group, you ask the pink and the blue groups to sound out in their head. If the students need your support, hey, how are you? so say, oh, sorry, we need to mute uh, whoever that was. Um, thank you. Uh, so if they get stuck, if they go S at sap, you simply say, you don't say, oh, have another turn, because if they could have done it, they would have. So if you run into trouble, they run into trouble, you say, my turn, S at sat, your turn, and then they repeat you. You just give it to them much easier and it supports their emotional um, well-being as well with the pink group though oh then we've got more words we'll go through we'll run through each of those with the pink group you're just giving them the word they don't need it grapheme by grapheme now they might be at a point where they could go pot pot just as easy as pie that's when we want to be moving them to reading in their head so you will say to them Pink group, I'd like you to read in your head. So you might say, read in your head, and they look at it and go. And then you'll need to give them a signal because otherwise you'll end up with that popcorn kind of stuff everywhere. And you say, ready? And when you click your fingers, then they say the word. Now that's not about being authoritarian, the clicking. You can have another signal, it's fine. But it's really just about making sure they answer as one group. And with the blue, you'll do the same. So we've got three words here. We don't need three. We can have two or one. 
and same deal for the blue. So as I said, this is going slowly because I'm explaining it to you as we go, but in real life, this is quite a quick routine. The next skill we teach and the last one, we are learning to segment words and write them down. This is that you run this the same way as you do for the graphemes that you want them to write. So you're not going to show it to them because we don't want them copying. We want them doing the heavy lifting. But these are the three words that you will have ahead of time and you'll write it down somewhere. And so you'll say to your, you won't be showing this, it'll look like that. And you'll say yellow group, your first word is sat. Everybody, let's sound out sat on our spelling fingers. Sat. And then you'll say to the yellow group, write it down. Pink group, your word is, what was it? Top. Pink group, your word is top. Go ahead. Blue group, your word is shop. Sound out your fingers yourself and write it down. Now, if your yellow group is really, really not able to do that for themselves, you can do it like this. You can say yellow group. I'll take that away so we're not confusing what it looks like. Yellow group, your word is sat. Your word is sat. Everybody, let's sound it out. Spelling fingers. S at sat. Can you help me so I can write it down? Ready? Let's go. S and you actually, you're not going to sound it out. They're going to sound it out for you. So they're still doing that sounding out for you. And you write it down and you say, wonderful. Let's read it back. S at sat. Yellow group, your turn. And you take it away. They still have to do the work of going in and sounding it out. And if they can't do that, then you're just going to say your grapheme is. Just give them grapheme. You give them whatever level they're up to. But that's just a way that you can differentiate content, but also provide a different level of adjustment for different students based on what their need is so that they can access the learning. And then nobody misses out.